Trinity United Church of Christ. We're glad to have you here with us as we pray for the world, as we resolve to live a life of faith in the world, uh, and uh, as we uh, join together to uh, give God thanks and praise. I'm Joan Cooper, and this is Sally Griffin, and we're part of the Breakfast Program, and we'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do and that how important your donations are. God is still speaking, and we are still serving. Trinity UCC continues to fulfill our commitment to local, national, and global service. Since 1995, the Breakfast Program mission has been important to Trinity Church. Every weekday morning, dedicated volunteers serve a hot and nutritious breakfast for those in need. During this pandemic, which has created much hardship for so many, Trinity remains committed to continuing these meals. Like so many things in the life of the church and in our personal lives, things are different. Currently, Kevin and Suzanne pass out paper bag meals in front of the church. Bags usually contain hot sandwiches or French toast or sausage wrapped in a pancake, along with juice, fruit, milk, pastry, and a hard-boiled egg. Thanks to donations from church members, local businesses, and Akron Food Bank, we have so far been able to continue this ministry. One of the things that our present program lacks is fellowship. Leisurely eating, laughing, talking together, sharing the news around tables, and supporting each other. Now, patrons pick up their meals, sit outside, or leave to eat their meals elsewhere. I think the volunteers miss the personal connections with the people we serve. Until seeing and talking with our breakfast friends was no longer possible, I didn't realize how important those connections were to me. The number of meals served continues to grow. On some days, we serve 90 to 100 people. Before the pandemic, we usually served between 50 and 60 people. The need now is great. In Matthew 25, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needed clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. In the words of Mother Teresa, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet, but yours. You, yours are the eyes through which he looks with the compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. We appreciate your donations to Trinity. so note that we can continue this vital ministry. Thank you and God bless. If you'd like to know more about Trinity Church, our website is www trinityucc.org and uh, on there you'll find all sorts of ways to connect with us in other ways in education and uh, in prayer and in mission and uh, we invite you to uh, to go to that page today uh, we're filming for a virtual worship service for October 18th already and as we uh, enter the fall season we continue to be in COVID time and we continue to pray for those people who are suffering and uh, also for uh, a vaccine and a time when once again we'll be able to gather together. Uh, we remember the liveliness uh, of this church when we're able to gather and we're hoping that uh, in, the, in the future we'll be able to send a notice to all of you to let you know when we will be prepared uh, with uh, certain precautions in place to come back together again and worship. But uh, otherwise, we're, we're happy that you are here and that you are watching these virtual services uh, and in that way maintaining what is a very important connection to God and to fellow church members. We especially welcome those of you who are here today as visitors. Uh, we have an interesting uh, service today for you in many different ways and I hope that you enjoy each part of it as we welcome you to worship. I always like to start uh, worship services. We used to <clears throat> call it a call to worship. 
Um, but uh, I, I, I have come to call it, since COVID time, uh, our opening affirmation. And uh, when we're in our Wednesday night prayer and communion service, we always say, use hymns as prayers. And uh, so <clears throat> each uh, time we gather for virtual worship, I also try to find a hymn that kind of helps me to keep the theme intact. Uh, and today uh, I have uh, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. And our opening affirmation is something that you can say along with me. And it's going to set the tone for what we talk about in our service today. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the clear though far off hymn that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Our scripture today is uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. It is the uh, 22nd chapter, verses 15 to 22. Both the scripture passages that I'm going to read today are from the Message uh, Bible, and they're uh, intended to be understandable in modern terms in English. Jesus is speaking. That's what I mean when I say Many people are invited, but only a few accept the invitation. That's when the Pharisees plotted a way to trap him into saying something damaging. 
So they sent their disciples with a few of Herod's followers mixed in to ask, Teacher, we know you have integrity. Teach the way of God accurately. Are indifferent to popular opinion and don't pander to your students. So tell us honestly, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew they were up to no good. He said, why are you playing these games with me? Why are you trying to trap me? Do you have a coin? Let me see it. They handed him a silver piece. This engraving, who does it look like? And whose name is on it? They said, Caesar. Then give Caesar what is his and give God what belongs to God. The Pharisees were speechless and they went off shaking their heads. And our second scripture reading is a letter from Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And 1 Thessalonians is, by most scholars accounting, the very oldest piece of uh, literature that we have in the New Testament. And uh, this is the beginning of his letter to the Thessalonians. I, Paul, together here with Silas and Timothy, Send greetings to the church of Thessalonica. Christians assembled by God the Father and by the Master Jesus Christ. God's amazing grace be with you. God's robust peace. Every time we think of you, we thank God for you. Day and night you're in our prayers as we call to mind your works of faith, your labors of love, and your patience of hope in following our Master, Jesus Christ, before God our Father. It is clear to us, friends, that God not only loves you very much, but also has put his hand on you for something special. When the message we preached came to you, it wasn't just words. Something happened in you. The Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions. You paid careful attention to the way we lived among you and determined to live that way yourselves. In imitating us, you imitated the Master. Although great trouble accompanied the Word, you were able to take great joy from the Holy Spirit. Taking the trouble with the joy the joy with the trouble. Do you know that all over the provinces of both Macedonia and Acacia, believers look up to you. The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word, not only in the provinces, but all over the place. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. People come up and tell us how you received us with open arms, how you deserted the dead idols of your old life so you could embrace and serve God, the true God. They marvel at how expectantly you await the arrival of his son, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from certain doom. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. As our service of worship continues, we invite children to come up for a word. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Well, it's good to have you here with us. And I um, hope you're enjoying time at home and uh, doing your school work. And I know that it's a lot different than it normally is, but I uh, want you to know that we're praying for you and uh, hope the best for you. We hope also that you're uh, you know, doing good things for other people. And today, mm, I got some things here. I want you to take a look at. See if you can tell me what it is. 
Alright, this might be a favorite kind of food for some of you. We got bagels. Bagels. This is a raisin bagel. You like raisin bagel? How about I got one with uh, uh, sesame seed on it. And I got one that uh, looks like it's another raisin bagel. And we got all sorts of food here, don't we? We got couple bags there. There's an everything bagel. You ever have an everything bagel? And these are some of the things that we give away every morning at Trinity. And some days we have as many as a hundred people that come for breakfast each day and we feed them. Well, we give them bread. We give them good things to eat, warm things. And I hope someday, if you're in confirmation, you can come uh, help us, help us to serve, because it feels good to do good. Now, um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, <clears throat> if somebody said, hey man, you got any bread? It meant something different. Bread was money. Hey man, you got any bread? Hey man, you got any money? But money is a way that we help people, right? And so um, we help people buy bread. We help people to be able to eat. And uh, <clears throat> in the life of the church, uh, we know that God has given us a lot of bread, given us a lot of, uh, in the old days when most of us were farmers, gave us all this produce from the field. And we didn't feel it was right just to save it for ourselves, but that we ought to share it with people. And in our scripture reads, readings today, uh, it's the same thing, that whatever we get, whether it's bread or, or money or crops or uh, a... Uh, something from school, it's all the same. It's something that God has given us, not to keep all for ourselves, but to make sure that everybody has enough. And we have great stories about Jesus, <clears throat> who took bread and broke it, and he gave it to everybody. And so, that's the way we had to be. It's called being generous. Thanks for coming up today. And I hope you think about what God is calling you to do in the world and how you can help and uh, be a part of um, a good thing for someone else's life. Join with me in a minute of prayer. Lord God, today we pray for the future of the world. We ask that you raise up for us leaders of a new generation that might bring peace and justice to this earth and might learn how to share what they have. And that they might uh, discover all sorts of new things that help people to live their lives better. And that those things might be shared freely. We thank you for this world that you've given us and uh, sunshine and all the things that you daily shower upon us freely. We're grateful. We thank you today for our daily bread. Watch over our children. Be with them. Keep them safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What a great piece of scripture we have today from Paul, 1 Thessalonians. Very old piece of scripture, one of the first churches that he was ever in. Uh, he was happy because he saw that they listened to his message and they, they acted, they did something about it. And he wrote a letter to them after he left. <clears throat> and he said to them, the news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. People come up to us and they tell us how you received us with open arms, how you deserted the dead idols of your old life so that you could embrace and serve God, the true God. And they marvel at how expectantly you await the arrival of his son, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from certain doom. You are the message. Isn't that something? Do you feel that way? That, you know, when we come to church, we hear scripture, we talk about Jesus, take up the offering, but you are the message about the way on earth ought to be. And you are the only message that many people will ever hear or see. And the real question for Paul was always, can the people of the communities of faith that we are a part of tell what we believe in, tell what we have faith in? 
Can people in the community tell what we have faith in by the way we act? Are we living examples of God's goodness and mercy for other people? One of the hard things that I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about why it's so hard to preach to an empty church. <clears throat> and, and I know why it is now. It's because I don't hear the stories. Every week someone has a story to share with us or with me. And we hear by the way that people tell their stories of just this past week. What kinds of good examples you have been in the community and the way you have done things for other people. The way you're thinking uh, creatively and compassionately about current events in the world. And the life of Paul and the life of Jesus were examples for us. That's what Paul said. And it's about our stories. It's about your stories and you are the message. How do we tell stories about people who do good? I've only been out of Wayne County three times since the pandemic. Okay, since March. And on one of those trips, we went to visit family in Michigan. And we took the turnpike and we got off at the turnpike near Clyde. I think it's called the Sandusky Turnpike Plaza. And many of you may not know it, especially if you haven't been on the turnpike lately, that in February of 2020, this very year, the state of Ohio installed historical markers for the Underground Railroad. And the Underground Railroad was not underground and it wasn't a railroad. It was a way for escaped slaves from the South to make their way to freedom in Canada. And Ohio is a very important part of that story. There are all sorts of stories of people in this part of Ohio particularly who watched out for people who were running away from violence and from slavery. So if you stop on that, and I encourage you to stop just so you can read the historical markers. The historical marker at the Commodore Perry Service Plaza tells the story of Elizabeth Lizzie Anderson, a former slave who escaped to Clyde and was helped by a local farmer. The marker says that based on the story about how she was discovered was that she was found with her child in a barn hiding out on the farm of Loomis Ames. And he wanted to help the woman, but she had been so abused in her life she wasn't wearing shoes. She had only a very small cloth bag with all their possessions in it. She kept hiding in the shed. She wouldn't come out. She wouldn't talk to them. She wouldn't tell them anything because she was so afraid that they would not be compassionate. So they began to leave food for her. And the woman and the child were able to eat there in their hiding place and then the family went on to bring her into their own home. And she stayed with them and cooked for them. And she later remained in the Clyde area for the rest of her life. She lived until February 11th, 1911, and is the only former slave who's buried in the Clyde Cemetery. So you gotta know that there's a decision point in our lives. And some of the major trails of the Underground Railroad, they cross right across the present day Ohio Turnpike. Some people even traveled along the, that pathway. The Ames family, they were the message. They were the message that compassion and love were alive in the world. Now we might imagine, gosh, I wonder what their religion was. 
I wonder what church they attended. How did they break out in compassion? Because they understood that they were the message. They were the only message that was available at the time when someone was in need. This week, two days ago, I had a call from a pastor from another denomination who wanted to know about the car loan program that was started in 2010. And uh, we started it because we knew that people had bad credit. And when you have bad credit, you pay more for everything. That uh, one of the biggest obstacles to being able to have a job was transportation and a car. And so from talking to people at the breakfast program and finding what it was uh, that, that held them down, uh, Joe Miller uh, brought in a newspaper clipping to me from a place in the East Coast uh, with a church that started a car loan program with the help of a local bank that could help people repair their credit. Now there are a couple of other car programs that have been started because people heard about our program. And I thought about that when I read those words of Paul to Thessalonians. I thought about Joe Miller. The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word, not only in the, this province, but all over the place. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. And we don't say anything about it, even though we're happy when people model it. But random people call us about that stuff. They call us about all sorts of things. They call us about the breakfast program. Some of the groups that have come in here for North Street Mission and worked with us, they'll call back and they'll say, hey, how did you work this out? Or what do you suggest we do about that? And how do we start this program in our own church? And truly, in the life of any church, there are so many things that go on beyond the eyesight of our members, beyond the, the eyesight of our pastors, because of what Paul said. You are the message. When uh, Glenn Royer was here as our so assistant pastor, he was a great visitation minister and he died in uh, December of uh, 2015 and his birthday is in October and it's like uh, really just a few days from right now and so <clears throat> and on Glenn's last birthday he came in to work like he always would he'd always work his birthday and the staff gave him a birthday card and it was one of those he could make up. And on the front of it, it said, I turned 94 today. And then when you open it up, it said inside, what did you do today? And there was his picture in it. Len Royer was a message. His faithfulness, his dedication, his compassion. Len Royer was a message. He went out to people who couldn't come in to hear the message. So it reminds me of this joke, this old joke, uh, about a man uh, who was asked about what he was doing this week. <clears throat> and uh, the guy said, what are you doing this week? And he said, well, on Monday, I'm teaching children in Cambodia. On Tuesday, I gave a car to someone who needed one. On Wednesday, I built a church in Africa. On Thursday, I served 100 breakfasts to hungry people in Worcester. And on Friday, I delivered medicine to a little boy in Mexico. And the guy goes, what? How could you have done all that? The man says, I belong to a church. I give every week. And my money helped people all over the world. Isn't that true? That when we are connected, and when we use our common resources, we can do so much. You not, might not be the hands that actually deliver those things. But if it weren't for you, those things wouldn't happen. 
You may recall a number of years ago, uh, Gene Kalman, uh, who was 120 years old, was the oldest living human being whose birth date could be authenticated. And in fact, she lived to 122. So she was asked to describe her vision of the future. And she replied, very brief. And when a reporter asked her what she liked best about being so old, she answered, there's no peer pressure. Then finally they asked her, because she was not feeling well, she said, I see badly, I hear badly, and I feel badly. But you know what? Everything is fine. Satisfaction in life doesn't always have to do with how much we have, but with what we do with what we have. I remember today seeing uh, also a news story about, some of you know Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk who was given the Nobel Peace Prize after he was nominated by um, Martin Luther King Jr. because he was trying to keep peace in Vietnam. He's 94, but he's not doing very well. He's not eating, and so people are concerned about him. But one thing about Eastern religion is this, is that when people are raising their children, they raise them to be holy people, to be a holy man, to be a holy woman. And there's that great uh, hymn uh, that we have. We do it at Christmas usually. Mary, did you know? Did you know that one day your son would walk on water? And Jesus didn't just come from nowhere. He knew stuff. He was a great justice and equality person. Now someone taught Jesus from a very young age to do those things. He was the product of a spiritual household. He was raised from his birth to be a genuine human being. Do we, when we have children and we baptize them, think of them as rising stars of love, peace, hope, and joy? Are we raising our children to be holy men and holy women? That's what our faith says we're doing. And that's what Mary did with Jesus through her faith. You know, uh, I've been talking about Dan Pink, uh, about him being one of my favorite authors. And uh, he uh, recommends a book by a man named Gary Hamill. And it's called Humanocracy. Humanocracy. Creating organizations as amazing as the people inside them. He says the bureaucracy stifles progress and stops innovation and change. And when we're in an organization that's stuck, it changes us and it helps us to be wrong-headed and to be lazy and to just do what we have to do. But he argues for something called a humanocracy. A humanocracy like Jesus brought into the world and the church. That you start with yourself. And bureaucracy has a personal inventory of things you do and don't do. But humanocracy, the possibilities are endless for ways that we can help people. It's not just our job, it's our calling, and it's our life. And we have to get back to this, to the notion of the sacred nature of our callings. And whatever it is you do through the week, you are the message. And even if you're in a bureaucracy, you can practice humanocracy. And I think that's what Jesus is saying in our story today about the coins. 
Do you go on automatic? Do you look the other way, put your head down and keep walking? The Levites and the priests and the story of the Good Samaritan were distracted by their bureaucracy and they forgot their humanity. And then instead of looking toward need, they looked away and they walked away. And systems do that to people. Don't wait for a system to tell you what good you can do in the world. Remember when we talked about the faith choices that we make? We covered two of them today. Choose bold over mild. The author of that book said, did I play it safe when I should have been bold? And you choose community over isolation. Bureaucracy crumbles when we stop acting like bureaucrats. Churches come alive when we start being genuine human beings. And the condition of the earth has deteriorated for quite some time now. And it still seems a little bit uncertain if we have time to stop that deterioration. How long humans will continue to survive on the planet. But yet we look at history. We look at God's saving action through people. And all predictions said, against all predictions, apartheid was dismantled. Against all predictions and dire warnings, the Berlin Wall fell. Against the terrible domination of slavery throughout the South for over 400 years. The slaves were emancipated. Despite the centuries long denial of rights for women. In the last 100 years, they gained the right to vote. We didn't think it would ever be possible for marriage equality to become the law of the land. And yet, in the past 10 years, dramatic changes have happened and the world is a bit more fair and just. And it happened because people were the message. That people rose up and did the right kinds of things and they were an example to others. And our task is to save this world. The goal of the gospel is to dispel this notion that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to get Jesus to admit that greed is good, that selfishness is normal, and that killing is necessary. And the passion that drove the early church was not fueled by the desire to increase church membership or to promise some compensation in the next life if you had a crummy one this life. Their passion came from liberating people from their fears and making a difference in this life. They saw the world differently. They weren't stuck in bureaucracy. They weren't stuck in accepting the way things always have been. They changed things. They liberated people from their fears. And people of faith simply do what needs to be done in the moment. They simply do what's necessary to stay spiritually alive. Just as we do all sorts of other things to enhance our lives, we have faith practices, prayer. And this whole thing about Caesar and God comes down to we need to take care of things here on earth, yes, as well as the world of the spirit. Martin Luther King said, everyone must decide whether they will walk in the light of Christ 
creative altruism or the darkness of destructive selfishness. So when one part of that body suffers, every other part suffers with it. That's Paul's description of the church. So too often in America today, when one part of the body suffers, people look away so much that we're intentionally blind to. Belief that if something bad happens to you, you must deserve it. You must have done something wrong and a denial of the basic circumstances of life. You know, sometimes it's just too easy for us to look away from our problems or to try to bury our head in the sand and forget about the troubles of the world. Because then we're not responsible. We don't have to do anything. But I don't think that way. I think that we are responsible no matter what the situation is. And if there's something that we can do about it, we should. And we've been so grateful for people throughout the ages who've been those wonderful examples for us who saw something in their life that they could do something about, and they acted. And they represented for all of us something that we saw in the life of Jesus, in the life of his mother Mary, who dedicated herself to teaching the faith to the next generation, and to make it clear that we are responsible, and that we do need to act. And it does change the world. It's easy to ignore problems, though. You know, so often I have conversations with people in this strange time we're living in. And they continually say that the COVID virus is a, a hoax. And they reassure me that it will all go away after the election because it's all politically motivated. By the time of this uh, video, uh, over 210,000 people have died in the United States, a million or more throughout the world. It kind of doesn't explain, does it, how all the other people are dying throughout the world from coronavirus and how somehow that's just an American hoax. seems really strange to me how we think up all sorts of reasons why we don't have to do something. Like be careful, like wear a mask, like be considerate of other people. But you know, thinking about all these things, there might be a virus that's worse than COVID-19. And that virus is fear. We're afraid to act. And that's why when we do act, we call it faith. And there's a big difference between inviting people to join a church and challenging them to be disciples. Hello, everybody from Trinity. Today, we have a very special celebration. And as many of you know, Emily Howard has uh, been with us for almost a year now. Uh, even though it's in COVID time, it seems strange for both of us because we've had to learn how to do a lot of things very differently than we are accustomed to. So it's been great uh, for Emily to be here to uh, help me in ministry uh, and for the ways that we have been able to reach out to all of you. And um, we're hoping uh, we really felt bad when we got closed down because we had all these plans and neat things we were going to do. Uh, and so we still have those great things and we're just waiting for the fog to lift and for the vaccine to come and for us to go back to, to uh, normal in the sanctuary. Uh, and uh, Emily uh, has been here uh, the whole time. And a uh, special thing uh, has happened in her life. She has been approved for ordination by the Church of Ministry of Northwest Ohio. Now, what that means is that we're connected to a big denomination called the United Church of Christ. And in the United Church of Christ, we have a conference. And it was the Ohio Conference, which they've called themselves now Heartland Conference, because we're expanded into a few other states now. 
And then we have associations, and they are responsible for helping people who want to be ministers to go through an intentional educational process as well as the process of working in a church and learning what it's like uh, in day-to-day -day activities in the life of the church. And we've been fortunate uh, enough to have Emily with us this past year, uh, and she's been working with us. Uh, she completed a Master of Divinity from uh, Mathesco Seminary uh, down in uh, Delaware, Ohio, and it's been good to have her with us. But now she's been approved for ordination. And uh, Trinity uh, loves to celebrate uh, ministry, uh, and I'm sure you will want to celebrate uh, with her and to know those things. Uh, I have in my hand here just a kind of a uh, something to show you. And uh, this is a red stole, which uh, when Emily is ordained, uh, will be uh, put a red stole around her neck because this is the sign of ordained ministry. And I know that means a lot to Emily uh, because we talked about stoles when she got here. Then she said, no, I don't want to wear a stole until I'm ordained because it means that much to me. And here we have the gifts of the spirit, the dove and the flames. Uh, and sometimes, you know, our faith is like a flame. And sometimes uh, chasing our faith is like a dove. It, it goes where it wills. And so we're grateful that the Spirit has, has uh, been with Emily through uh, many years of study and uh, uh, many different experiences in the life of the church. Uh, to be here in this moment is a great thing for Trinity Church. And it's a great thing for you uh, to witness. And we also want to say that ministry is no different uh, when we're ordained than it is for you. Uh, and all of us have a sense in our life of having a sense of purpose, a God-given purpose. And we know that many of you, uh, you know your God-given purpose and you live it out every day. Uh, and now we're grateful that Emily uh, has this God-given call and this purpose to serve in ordained ministry in the United Church of Christ. And we're fortunate to have her here with us uh, as uh, that great milestone is met. And uh, Emily uh, had a few things that she wanted to say on this occasion. Thank you, Reverend Franklin. I really miss seeing you in these pews. And as we stand here, I'm reminded um, we are not alone. And I know I'm not alone as I celebrate because I feel your spirits with me. Um, on the day of my ordination interview, I knew I was supported in prayer by so many of you, um, by Pastor Kevin, by Suzanne, by our whole staff team, by our consistory, and it means the world to me personally. Um, but it's also a privilege to serve um, because we are united in Christ. All of us are one body, um, and I do feel that companionship with you in this season. Um, when I came to this place, it I knew would mean a great deal to me. And yet, uh, as I approach my first year of service with you, I do know that this is my faith home. Um, you are my faith family and my community. Um, and I tell that story. Um, and any time that I speak about my ministry, I feel so fortunate and privileged to serve Trinity United Church of Christ. Um, lastly, I have a song on my heart. When I first stood in front of you to um, accept the invitation to serve you, I sang. Um, and today I sing a new song. And uh, it's an easy one, so join me in it um, from your hearts, from your um, spiritual space here. I'm in our sanctuary. I hope you feel connected as much as I feel connected to you. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Again, I'm going to live so God can use me. the joy of God's call on your own heart today and in my mind I just know that the call is strong enough to empower you me Kevin Suzanne the whole faith family of the United Church of Christ forever amen and uh, now uh, I want to have a special prayer for Emily and I also want you to keep Emily in your prayers uh, as we uh, head toward ordination and we'll let you know more about how you might be able to be involved in that maybe even to witness that because, of course, we're in COVID time, so we're not really sure how that's going to play out. Uh, but we're hoping uh, that, that no matter what, 
we can all participate in it and, uh, and, and be, be witness to that event. So uh, I hope also that you're lifting up your prayers for uh, everyone uh, today who's uh, uh, a, a part of the larger ministry of the church. So uh, let's just join together in a, a prayer blessing for Emily. Almighty God, uh, you uh, bring us into this world uh, in purpose. Uh, and uh, we know that you have gifted Emily uh, with the tools of ministry. And we thank you for her compassion and her resolve and her dedication to the task uh, for love for people. And we pray that uh, as you uh, put those gifts within her those years ago, that uh, you might continue to grow those gifts through her experiences here at Trinity and in the, the broader life of the church. Uh, we thank you that she heard your call and has responded. We uh, thank you that you saw her through all those uh, long journeys of education and, and learning what it means to pastor and to be in the presence of people and sometimes a very difficult suffering and moments of need. Uh, and we pray today because we know that the future holds a rich blessing for the people who uh, cross Emily's path and who are a part of her ministry. We ask that in the days ahead and as we uh, look forward to the ordination service and the rite of ordination, that you might bless Emily and help her uh, to see her life and her gifts continue to unfold. Watch over her in a special way. We're grateful for her presence here at Trinity with us, and we pray your full blessing upon her and upon us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, church. Thank you. God is good. And you're saying at home all the time. Yeah. Amen. And now we close our service of worship with... Uh, with a uh, closing benediction, and it's the words of that great song, uh, My Life Flows On, an Endless Song. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging, since love is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing? Amen. Amen.